thank you. Do you know them? Can you just find out their names? Find out the names of the people around you. We are friends. I like how we just bought this here. to make the whole group quiet, okay? There's only one way I've known throughout the world, okay? If you want a group of ladies to be quiet or a group of people to be quiet, all you have to do is say, let's take a picture, okay? No, 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 okay. Let's take a picture, okay? Yeah. Okay, so everyone say, hi! Hi! Okay, okay, anyway. So welcome to our Bible study series. Let me give you a little background. Okay, um, a Christ Commission Fellowship began in the early 1980s. And it started with a Bible study in the Punsalang residence. In about, and uh, that is the grandfather of my wife, Leigh. So in that Bible study, it was a few businessmen. I think uh, they were three couples who started the Bible study. And then they just kept on inviting people to attend Bible studies until it grew. And it was formalized into Christ Commission Foundation in 1984. So it's now uh, 33 years, going 34 years. And by God's grace alone, and uh, it's really, you know, you know it's only by God's grace and it's a miracle that we are now in about 60 uh, satellite branches in the Philippines and all over, all over the world. Okay, so more important than just the number of branches, it is about the change life, and it is about people being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. So for me, my personal experience was in 1989, my mom invited me to a Bible study in Asian Institute of Management. So it was a Bible study just like this. And it's amazing, the lesson that I learned there is something that I've been teaching throughout the years and some of the lessons that we will teach here in this Biblical Foundation class were lessons I learned 20 plus years ago, right? So, yeah, so just a little background again, the mission of CCF, why we exist, our mission uh, is to honor God and to make Christ-committed followers to make Christ-committed followers. So we are here to teach people to honor God, okay? Daily, not just on Sundays, we want to teach people how to honor God. And it's not simply by singing praise songs to Him, it is a lifestyle of obedience and humility towards God. So our goal is to make Christ-committed followers. We are not, our goal is not to have the largest church attendance, our goal is to create, to make the Christ-committed followers who are obeying Him, and later on make Christ-committed followers as well. Can you, just, can you see the slides at the back? Okay, can you see the slides? All right. Okay, wonderful. So our vision is to see a movement of millions of Christ-committed followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, meeting in small groups, transforming lives, families, communities, and nations for the glory of God. So, why small groups? Okay? This is kind of unique because um, the goal is to have everyone be part of a small group. So, we call them in, the, in New Zealand or in any CCF branch, we call them discipleship groups or D groups. And uh, used to be called care groups, then cell groups, and then became discipleship groups. Why? First is, in a small group, there's more connection than when it is in a large group. Okay? Church is a family that loves one another. As it grows in number, you can easily get lost. You right? You can easily get lost in a crowd. And that is not how it should be in a spiritual family. So there's more connection um, in a small group. Next is there's more interaction. Okay? Unlike when you hear a sermon, the groups provide the avenue to ask questions, discuss, and learn from one another how to become more Christ-like and to make the messages more relevant in everyone's life. So that is why we really want people to be in the deep group so that they can interact. And of course, obviously, more participation. Okay? Going to Sunday services might lead to a mindset 
that you're simply being a consumer about and what can I get out of the message, what can I get out of this when I sing songs that I want to feel something, you know? So that's not really our goal. In a small group setting, you're, there's more participation and it is in a small group where you are able to experience love better and you're also able to uh, display love better to other people. Okay? So even in a group like this, this is already pretty big and that's why we want everyone to be part of a small group. Okay? So that's our background. Um, the name of our of our training center is called GLC, a Global Leadership Center. So these are lessons that were developed by Bible teachers, Bible graduates, and people in the Philippines. And uh, you know they they they've been uh, editing it and reviewing it all these years. And what we want is to provide you the biblical foundation of your you know. Because there's so many things you can learn from the Bible, right? And sometimes you don't know where to begin. But if you have this biblical foundation, we hope that these are lessons that will solidify the foundation of your life and it will help strengthen you, transform you, and you can help transform others. All right? All the lessons that we teach here, we basically desire it to be two things. It is transforming and it is transferable. You get it? Transforming because it changes you. It is transferable because we want you to be able to pass it on to others. So we will not, in GLC, we don't teach you everything and every theology in the Bible because that is not the objective of GLC. GLC's objective is we will just give you enough lessons that transform your life and at the same time, uh, simple enough so that you can pass it on to others. If you want much, much deeper stuff, then there are Bible schools that you can attend, right? And uh, But that is not the actual goal of, of GLC. Okay, so are we ready? Okay, this is not your seatmate. Are you ready? I'm ready. How about you? <laughs> so why don't we commit this time to the Lord? I'm excited. And uh, yeah, I'll just share with you a few things. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for bringing us here. We, Lord, Lord Father God, could have chosen other options, but we decided to be here. And we pray, Lord Father God, that you will speak to each and every one of us, no matter what level of spiritual maturity or what level of knowledge that we have with you or what level right now of intimacy we have with you right now. May you be the one to speak to each and every one of us, Lord Father God, so that you will empower us, we will understand, the truth will set us free, you will speak to us clearly, and this is something that can transform us. And this is something that we can transfer to others so that they can learn as well. So thank you, Lord Father God. We pray that your Holy Spirit will fill us right now, be in this place. Lord, override all my preparation so that anything I teach will be just what you want me to say. To you be all the glory alone. For we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So it's sort of different from uh, preaching because preaching on a Sunday, uh, you know, there, um, we share messages, we have outlines and stuff like that. But in a Bible study, we want you to go deeper into God's Word. Okay? In, in a preaching, CCF's goal is about 70% of the preaching on a Sunday is what is practical in your life. Okay? In a Bible study, the idea is there is more theology involved so that you will have an understanding. Why is this important? The Bible says that in the last days, there will be false teachers. In the last days, there will be people who will show and act and say things that sound so true that it will actually deceive a lot of people, right? There are things that are, there are some topics that are debatable, correct? But there are some topics that cannot be debated on because this is the foundation of our faith, all right? So this one, these are the lessons that we want to teach you. So that's a, there's, a big, there's a bit of a difference, okay? So if I ask you, what is the hardest question that you ever received for a job interview? Here, I 
Okay? What is it? Fill your email. What is a hard question you received? Huh? Why should I hire you? Okay, what's the best answer? Why not? <laughs> okay. Okay, what is the hardest question you see in the job interview? Okay. Was it a technical question? I don't know. Okay, so I still remember right after graduation. Um, I was in an interview in the boardroom with 10 top managers, okay? So this was like, wow, this is really new to me. I was 19 years old, about to graduate, and there were like 10 top managers and senior managers in front of me. So they asked me a lot of questions, and I kept praying before that, so I felt confident by God's grace. And then, the biggest question in that interview was, so Ryan, if I were to assign you to the remotest village in the remotest part of the country and assign you there to demonstrate to people there how to wash clothes using bars of soap, okay? Will you be willing to be assigned, okay? So, so of course I didn't want that, right? I just wanted to stay, you know, in a... Uh, in Manila that time. But you know what? I was confident that time. I just looked at that manager and I said, yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Okay. And I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Thinking, Lord, yes, I'm willing, but I don't want that. Well, after that interview, I was hired. <laughs> okay, so I was hired. So that was, I think, the most critical question in that job interview because they were checking how willing was I and how committed was I if they employ me in that company. Okay? You know what? I believe also that there is one, there are one, there is one major critical question that every one of us needs to answer and we cannot leave it by chance. It is where do you think you are going when you die and why, right? Because this is for eternity. You cannot leave it to chance and just hope that there is, yes, life after death and you just hope that you will go to heaven, okay? Many of us, maybe growing up, have this idea that we just hope and we just do this in order to increase our chances to go to heaven. But the question is, who told you that? Okay, who told you that? The, what we want to teach you is what does the Bible say, okay? It's like Fox News, okay? There was a time that the tagline of Fox News is, we report, you decide, okay? We report, you decide. So the idea here in Bible studies, we report what the Bible says, and then you make the personal decision, okay? So... This is important because eternity is at stake. Now there are four there are four ways where you can base your answer to that question about okay, what do I believe in when it comes to eternity? First is it can be about it can be tradition, right? History dictates my beliefs because this is what has been uh, done in the past then that is what dictates my belief, okay? If it was right in the past, then I guess it should be right until now. The second basis of your belief can be opinions of others, okay? Certain people, certain people that I look up to are those wherein I will base my beliefs. Another is personal feelings. I myself dictate my beliefs, okay? The problem with these three is it is not that stable, correct? If you base your beliefs simply on tradition, opinions, or personal feelings, it can change. Even traditions can change. So for us, our mind, our worldview is a biblical worldview. We believe it's the Bible, it is God's word that dictates my beliefs. Now, there will be another lesson why we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Okay, so we're, we're going to teach that another time. So for us, the Bible is God's manual to life. 
In it, He reveals His instructions on how we are to live the life that He has given us. Okay? So someone gave this like acrostic for what Bible is. B-I-B-L-E. Okay? Someone once said this, basic instructions before leaving earth. Okay? So if you like that, you can, you can copy that. Okay? It's not copyrighted. Okay. It is God's manual for us. We can try to live our lives our own way, but the best way is to know the manual for life. Okay? So for the Bible, in it, He reveals His design intent. In it, He reveals the answer to one of man's biggest questions. Okay? So that is why we call it the good news. Okay? In the Bible, the word gospel, have you heard of the word gospel? Okay, the gospels, right? The word gospel simply means good news. And that's what we want to talk about tonight, okay? Now, for some of you, this is something you've known already. For some of you, this is new. And that is great. That is wonderful, okay? So I'm thinking, I'm hoping that within this whole Bible study, you will have two kinds of reactions, okay? One reaction is, ooh. The other reaction is, ah. Got it? Okay. One reaction is, ooh. Why? Because it's something new and it's something that's opening your eyes right now. Ooh. The other one is, you already know this and you are just being reassured with the Bible verses that you hear. And you say, ah. All right? So, what's that? Ooh. Ah. Okay, anyway, anyway, thanks, thanks, sorry, I need to control myself, okay? So what is the gospel? What is the good news, okay? First is, okay, God's plan, God's plan. So God's plan, God loves you and desires that you have a meaningful life on earth through an intimate relationship with Him, okay? So let me read this first. Okay, if you have your Bibles, I even suggest you use your Bibles. Okay, John chapter 10, verse 10. Are the people here able to see? No. Are you able to see it? Okay. Okay. So let's read this, okay? I'm going to ask the ladies to read this first. Okay? Yeah? Next slide. Okay. Let's read. Ladies, read this. Ready? Go. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. See? So the thief here, of course, ultimately it's Satan, but thief here in its context are false teachers. They are teaching like the Pharisees. They're teaching the people, you have to do this, you have to do that in order to gain heaven and be right with God. Okay? So the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it to the full. Now, the word full there is from the Greek word perisos. Okay? P-E-R-I, not peri-peri. Okay? Perisos. Not peri-perisos. Okay? That's different. Perisos. P-E-R-I-S-O-S. What, what does perisos mean? They okay? have it to the full. Perisos means a life that is super abundant, life that is so overflowing, okay? life that is to the full. Okay? That is the plan that God has for every person. Okay? I come that they may have life and have it to the full. God has good purposes for everyone. Okay? So, example, uh, just five years ago, okay? Well, Zoe was uh, just a few months old during that time. I held her in, in my arms, okay, because she was like just this big before. And when I look at her, you know, being a, a, a father, I have many plans for her. I plan that I will be able to help her grow intellectually, spiritually. I had plans for her to develop emotionally, okay? Even for her future husband, I told you know, I told her, you know, you can you can start dating at 40. Okay? You know, I had plans for her. Okay? I had plans. Okay? I had plans for her. 
because out of my love for my daughter, I have plans and great plans for her. And that is just being an earthly father with limited time and limited resources. For God, He's saying, I have plans for you. And it is super abundant, overflowing, that you cannot even plan it yourself. Because God has greater plans for you. And not only that, not only does God have great plans, He has the resources and He has all the time and energy to make it happen in your life. Okay? So God has wonderful plans for you. In the same way, He wants us to have an intimate relationship with Him. I had plans with my daughter that we would grow really close. We would go to different places and build a strong relationship together. How much more a Heavenly Father who wants to have an intimate relationship with us. Okay? But next year is, God also desires that we have a sure place in heaven. A sure place in heaven through a right relationship with Him. Okay? So... Just like any earthly father, he wants his children to be with him as long as possible. For God, he wants us to have a relationship with him that lasts for eternity. Okay? So I'm going to ask people to read, to read verses. Okay? So let's read, let's read verse 1 and 2. Okay? I'm going to ask you to read verse 1 and 2. Okay? Okay, go ahead. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. You believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going to place for you? Okay. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also meet me where I am. You know the way. To the place where I am going. Okay, thank you. Just, you can just hold it, right? Okay, go back to the, go back, go back, okay? So it says here, do not let your hearts be troubled. You know what? If you do not know what's going to happen for eternity, it's possible you can get worried. You can be anxious because eternity is a long time, right? And you cannot just put it to chance. But God is telling us, you do not need to have your hearts troubled. Okay? Why? Because in the end, you believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house, there are many rooms. This point shows us that heaven is a real place. Some people will teach you or teach people that heaven is just a feeling. And that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that heaven is a real place. And it says here that it's Jesus who prepares a place for us. So in a way, Jesus and God is the architect of this place. Okay? He is the architect. Now, if human architects, and I've been to many architectural awards uh, nights because that's the job of my wife and she, I, I go with her during architects awards nights. I've seen wonderful architecture here in New Zealand, especially when the owner has a lot of money, okay? But for God, who has unlimited resources, and with all the wisdom, He is the architect of heaven, okay? And He has, he has that as a wonderful, a wonderful plan for us. Now, here's the problem. If, if this is what God wants for man, okay? Yeah, I can do okay? okay? If, they, if this is what God, God wants for man, why is it that most people don't have a meaningful life on earth and certainty of a, certainty of a sure place in heaven? Okay? This is because... Okay, click. Yeah. Click, click. Okay, man's problem. Okay? Man has a problem. God has a plan, but it's not pushing through because man has a problem. What's the problem? Okay. We have sinned and our sins have separated us from God. Okay. Let's look at Romans 3 verse 23. Okay. It says, all have sinned. Yeah? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, 
If it's all, does that include me? I have sinned. Okay. Does that include your seatmate? Can you look at them? Do they look like a sinner? Yes. Okay. Very sounding yes, sir. Okay. So, does that include your seatmate? Yes. Does that include you? Yes. Yes, right? So, all have sin. Can you tell to your seatmate, all have sin? All have sin. Okay. All have sin and fall short of the glory of God. All. So that is includes everyone. This is still not good news, right? This is bad news. All have sin and fall short of the glory of God, right? So, what is sin by why is sin anyway? One definition of sin is that you are missing the mark. Got it? So, for example, anyone here play darts? Yeah. You want darts? The boys, where's the single men? They have seen them play darts. Okay? Milo, you're the best dart player I've ever seen. Okay? It's like over there. Okay? Okay? So, when you say sin is defined as missing the mark, that's just one of the definitions, but it's a good description. Like, if there is this dart board, and there is like a bull's eye, okay? Missing the mark means you do not make, you do not hit the bull's eye. Maybe you hit some areas that has points, okay, or some areas way out of the dartboard. But still, if it is not bull's eye, you still miss the mark. You got it. So in a way, same thing. God has a, God has a specific standard. And when you sin, it means that you miss the mark of God's standards. Okay? So, it, sin is anything that's, that doesn't meet the standards of God, whether it is an action, attitude, or attempt. We focus on the action. And we detest people that have sinned greatly. Right? You know, in this world... When you just look at the news or your social media feed, you know that there is sin happening in this world, correct? Yes. But most of the things that we see out there are sins that are action related. But there are also sins of the heart that we do not see. There are some attitudes, there is even some just attempts. But because there is even an attempt or an attitude, you are already missing the perfect mark of God. So even if there was no action, but there was already an attitude or an attempt, it is already sin in God's eyes because you have missed the mark in terms of your thinking. Okay? So all have sinned and fall short. Okay? So if it means all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So how many have sinned? All. How many fell short of the glory of God? All. all. So that means all of us cannot go to heaven based on this verse. Okay? Is that good news? No. no, right? All have sinned and you're separated from God forever. Okay? So we have failed to do or be what God intended us to be. Okay? Now I don't know... <coughs> Do you still remember the first sin you've ever committed? Okay? I mean, do, you, do you remember the first time you disobeyed your parents? Okay? I don't know. I don't remember, right? But for sure, we have sinned. So, let me give you a little example of what sin is. Because sometimes we think, well, I, I, I think I'm good. Right? Okay. You think I'm good? No. <laughs> All of sin, right? All of sin, okay? So, let's see. First is, sin includes the wrong things we do. Okay? First John chapter 5, verse 17. Okay? Uh, Grace Ryan to pass it on to M. James. Let's read. Yeah. First John 5, verse 17. Yeah, it's working. All, all wrongdoing is sin. So all wrongdoing is sin. So anything that you do, cheating, compromising, that is sin. 
Okay? Now, have you ever cheated in a school exam? Yes. Okay. Yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you seem so happy. <laughs> okay? Now, I've known... Okay? I've known all of the types of strategies in terms of cheating in an exam. Okay? It is still. Whether... Okay, here's my mindset, right? It's a weird mindset. For me, cheating is bad. Cheating is a sin if you cheat on a final exam. <laughs> but if I cheat in copying my homework, the homework of my classmate, or a quiz that has just 10 items, that's not cheating. That's just brotherhood. <laughs> <laughs> Okay? So that's my standard. But for God, all wrongdoing is sin. So if, I don't know how you've cheated. Okay? I don't know if in your back in your back in your original country, did you cheat to get your driver's license? Yes. <laughs> okay? In the Philippines, you don't cheat. They cheat for you. <laughs> yeah, okay? Like for me, they, they said driving test, driving test. So I, I went to the car, started, and they said, okay, reverse, reverse. Okay, you pass. Okay, go inside. <laughs> okay? I'm just saying, all those doing is sin. Whether we think it's big, whether we think it's small, sin is sin in the eyes of God. You understand? Sometimes we think sin has its levels. The sin of cheating is okay if it's a quiz. A sin of cheating in a final exam is wrong because it has, it has a heavier weight. Sometimes we think lying is okay, but murder is wrong. In the eyes of God, all wrongdoing is sin. Okay? So, if I ask you, are you, are you, are you guilty just with that? Okay? Next. Look at this. A sin includes the right things that we fail to do. Right? So, Jake, can you pass the microphone? Okay. Mami, Mami Tani. Are you able to read it? James yes. Anyone that knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, sin. Is that clear? Yes. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, sin. Sin, right? So for example, God is leading you to donate some money to this certain charity, but you refuse to do it. In the eyes of God, you failed some, to do something that He wanted you to do. So for you, that is sin. Okay? Do you understand? Okay? So that is James chapter 4, verse 17. So if, not, not only that, if you delay in obeying God, that is also sin. Because you did not meet the timing of God. Okay? So, have there been things in our lives that we have failed to do? Okay, maybe God was telling you to share the gospel, invite people to a Bible study or a tea group, and you did not do it, then that is sin to you. Okay? Number three is the wrong things we say. Okay? The wrong things we say. Okay? We'll ask uh, Maya to read it. But I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. Okay. Now this is strong. It says, I tell you that men will give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. Okay? It can be as simple as cursing. It can be as deep as backbiting or lying. In my experience, when I was still working in the corporate world, the pantry area was the area where sin abounds. 
That is when during lunchtime, it's like the hour of bashing the boss. That's what I did, mean, right? Praise God, because I became a Christian, I had to walk away because I get affected by the conversations around the pantry. Okay? But it says here, it will be taken to account. It also, that means that words that you said behind people's back, you are accountable for that. Right? For example, your parents told you to do something and you said yes to it, but you were grumbling when you went back to your room and you were murmuring and you were whispering. Every careless word, you will be accountable. So if that is part of, if that part includes sin, everything that we say, are we going to fail? Yes. Every word, right? Have you experienced that every sentence that you say, there's a curse at the start or at the end? Have you experienced that? Yes. Or is it, is it just me? <laughs> okay. No? So that was my past, okay, where I would curse either at the start or at the end of every sentence. Okay, next. What does sin include? It also includes the wrong things we think. So it's not even doing, right? It's the wrong things that we think. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Okay, I guess uh, Dorothy, are you able to read it? The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Okay, so inclination of the thoughts of his heart. So God not only sees our actions, not only does God see our reactions, God sees our motives. So even if all the actions outwardly were right, but your motives was selfish or for your self-interest, then in the eyes of God, you are still sinning. Correct? For example, for me, if I were to preach the best message I can preach, and finally no one sleeps during the message, okay, I can preach the best message, people might say they were blessed, but if my motive was to gain accolades, have I sinned? I have sinned, right? So if there are wrong things that we think, that's included. Have we sinned? Yes, right? Sometimes when people offend us, we have those thoughts of revenge, correct? When people malign us, there are thoughts of how to, you know, all these evil thoughts come into our head. Okay? Growing up, even today, many people have lustful thoughts. Okay? And lustful thoughts can be related to immorality, or the lustful thoughts is lusting for more material gain. So those are thoughts. Thoughts of jealousy, thoughts of envy, that is included. Okay? So, are we gonna pass? <laughs> okay, next. What does sin include as well? The wrong things we intend. Okay? The wrong things we intend. Matthew 5, verse 28. But I, oh, sorry, I'm gonna ask this man to read it. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay, so there are several verses in the Bible similar to this. Yes, the Bible says in the Old Testament, do not commit adultery. But because God sees everything, even our motives and our intentions, if there is already lust in your eyes and intentions, that is already sin. Okay? So, are we sinners? Yes. Okay? That is the bad news. We are all sinners. But here's what I think. The more we realize how much we have sinned, the more we will appreciate what happened in the cross. Okay? So it is all right to admit and realize that all the categories of sin, you are included. Because all the more you will appreciate and worship the God who saved you. Okay? Based on that, who then can be saved, right? In James chapter 2, verse 10, I'm going to ask uh, Molly. 
For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point, is guilty of breaking all of it. Okay, can you look at this? Given that you are really a good person and you keep every law, okay, based on the Bible, you keep all the law, but you stumble at how many points? Just one, right? Just one. Okay, you were good 99%, but at one point, you sin, right? What is the Bible's conclusion to that? You are guilty of breaking all of it. So all it takes in the eyes of God to be a sinner, all it takes is one sin. Okay? Put it this way. How many times must you kill to become a murderer? How many times must you commit adultery to become an adulterer? Okay? Is it, is it in the slides? How many times must you steal to become a thief? Okay, how many times must you lie in order to become a liar? Once, right? And also, how many times must you sin to become a sinner? Once, right? In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, okay, I'm going to ask, are we? Romans 6, 23a, for the wages of sin is death. For the wages of sin is death. Okay? So, for God, one sin is all it takes to deserve death. Okay? So, let me give you an illustration. Okay? Can you see this? Okay. So, this is called the goodness chart. Okay? The goodness chart. Okay? It's 100% good. This is 0%. Okay? 100% is perfectly good. Okay? Zero is <coughs> perfectly bad. Okay? Now, if I ask you, can you give me a give me a name of a person that you believe is a good person? Okay, good person. You know how many <laughs> That's not true. Okay. Think of a someone, a celebrity. Think of a good person. <laughs> huh? Gandhi. Okay, Gandhi. Okay. Where will we put Gandhi? Where will we put Gandhi? Was he a good person? He brought peace, right? Oh, maybe here? Okay. How do you spell Gandhi? Huh? I think this is a Filipino who added the H. Filipino added the H. Right? Where's, where's, where's Rahaya? Okay. Okay. Think of someone who's really bad. So here, here. Okay. Oh, some, am I correct? Yes. Sir. Okay, okay. So where do you think uh, Pastor Peter, our senior pastor, where do you think? A hundred. <laughs> Maybe here? Uh, okay, Pastor Peter. Okay. So if that was the perfectly good scale, perfectly bad scale, okay? For example, where would we put uh, Brother Philip? <laughs> Where would you put yourself? Where would you put yourself? You probably put it somewhere here, maybe. Right? Maybe. Okay. If you're honest, you know, we just talked about all wrong doing is sin, all the action, you know? <laughs> Talk about that. Right? So maybe you put yourself there. Okay? Put yourself there. Okay? But it says the wages of sin is death. For us, we come up with our own moral standards okay so where where is the passing grade for you to go to heaven right i still remember when i was in grade school the passing grade was 75 okay what's the passing grade right based on a goodness scale what is the passing rate for you to go to heaven okay so sometimes we think that's true, I agree, you're good. Okay? But what what standard 
usually our standard of goodness is based on comparison with other people. So if you compare, okay, I I I have more goodness in my life compared to Hitler. Okay, can you look at the person beside you? They do, do they look like someone who is better than Hitler? Yes. <laughs> submit, submit. Okay, submit. <laughs> That's fine. In James chapter 2, verse 10, right? Again, it says, okay, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking them all. Got it? So one sin makes you. Uh, this one sin disqualifies you to go to heaven. So if you want to go to heaven based on being good, God's standard, not mine, is you have to hit 100% from the day you were born till the day that you die, you must be perfectly good in order to pass his test and you can go to heaven. You understand? That is why it is called man's problem. Because in itself, no one can have the capacity to be good from beginning to end. And this is not even talking about the sinful nature that is already in us when we were born. Okay? So this is God's standard, not my standard, the Bible standard. Okay? Do you understand so far? Yes. So, because that is God's standard, He says, He says that if you have even just one sin, the wages of sin is death. Can you tell your seatmate, give me synonyms or descriptions or definitions of what is a wage? What is a wage? So, wage is something that is given to you because you work, right? Then here, the wages of sin is death. Because you have sinned, what you deserve is death. Okay? One sin, and you deserve already death based on the Bible. So, in the Bible, technically there are three kinds of death. Okay? One is physical death, wherein everyone will experience physical death. Anyone here planning to live physically forever? Okay? Okay, all of, all of you still look young. Okay? In the Bible, the word death is not cessation. In the Bible, the word death is more linked to the definition of separation. So physical death is the separation of the soul and the body. Okay? The second kind of death is called spiritual death. We are separated from God while we were, are alive here on earth. So physically, you are alive, but spiritually, you are dead. Okay? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Um, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Yeah. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions. Okay? So spiritual death. Third kind of death, related to spiritual death, is called eternal death. Eternal death, we will be permanently separated from God forever after physical death. Okay? So physical death happens, and then there's an eternal death where you are separated from God forever. You are, you are absent in the presence of God. So God is in heaven, you will not be in the presence of God. In Revelation 20 verse 15, it says, yeah, I don't, um, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, so we will have another topic in the future about the difference and the reality of heaven and hell. 
but this is a description of what is that there is indeed separation forever. Okay? So here's the problem. In Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. Um, can you do it? Okay. Isaiah 64, verse 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Okay. So all of us have become like one who is unclean. So unclean meaning we have sin, right? You understand? At the back, are you still with me? Yes. Hear me? Okay? So all of us have become like one who is unclean. And all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Okay, what do you mean? Righteous acts is like doing good. Anything you can do to do good, to try to convince God that because of these good works, you need to accept me and go to heaven. Alright? So I can be with heaven. I will do all this good. For God, righteous acts as a way to go to heaven is like filthy rags. Okay? Now this is a very strong word. The word filthy is from the Hebrew word ida, I-D-D-A-H. Okay? And the word filthy here, filthy rags here, is literally... How do I say this? Okay? This is the bodily fluids that women have monthly. So this is like the menstruation menstruation cycle. And during that time, they use rags because they do not have whisper. Okay, sorry, I am not familiar. Okay? But can you imagine the rags that are used to clean the, bod the monthly bodily fluids of women. That is how God sees righteous acts. Because sin cannot be covered by simply doing good works. Sin must be removed. God is not against good. Actually, He wants us to do good, right? But it is not how to go to heaven, okay? Doing good works is not God's way to go to heaven. It is a byproduct of receiving Jesus into your life. Okay? We are all, so, so like filthy uh, rags. So we are commanded to do good works, but that is not God's way to make yourself acceptable. I think the reason we have that mindset is growing up, okay, especially teenagers, okay, they're, sometimes they're rebellious. But, when they want something from their parents or they want the approval to go to a party in the next few weeks or get permission to borrow the, the family car, they start doing good weeks before they get that permission. Do you understand? Yes. It happens. It happens. It happens. <laughs> right? So you're trying to do good in order to um, persuade God for you to go to heaven, okay? For God, it is filthy rags. It is not His way, okay? So, based on this, so far, God is saying He has a wonderful plan for us. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it to the full. Perisos, super abundant, overflowing, and yet, because of the problem of sin, we are not experiencing that. And there are different kinds of sin. All wrongdoing is sin, even sins of the heart, intentions, even the good that we ought to do but we did not do, that is sin in God's eyes. And in God's eyes, the standard of perfection is the only standard He is going to accept for anyone to be with Him in heaven. Because one person's sin cannot be allowed in heaven and in His presence. Okay? So, because of that, we will go to eternal death. That is why there is the gospel. Because God provided the only way out. So, God's provision. Okay? God's provision. Jesus Christ is God's only solution to our sin problem. Okay? It is only through Him 
that we have, a, we can have a meaningful life here on earth and a sure place in heaven someday. So Jesus Christ is God who became a man without ceasing to be God. So where does the Bible say that Jesus is the only way to be reconciled to God? Okay, uh, Irene, John 14, 6. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Okay. You know what? Truth is exclusive. And this is what the Bible says. No one goes to God, no one goes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. So some people will say, you know what? We can go different paths because it will all reach the same destination anyway. That sounds great, but is that what the Bible says? It says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, I usually ask this, you know, those who are good in grammar, good in composition. What would be the difference if they change the article the to an article a? Okay? Jesus answered, I am a way, I am a truth, and I am a light. Okay? What would be the difference? I am a way, a truth, and light versus I am the way, the truth, the light. What's the difference? Okay, yeah, I, I think I hear the answer. If you say I am a way, a truth, I am a light, meaning there are different options for you to go to heaven. But if you say I am the way, the truth, and the light, that means there is only one exclusive way. Okay, you know what? Sometimes we, why is the Bible so exclusive? You know, well, you know what? Truth is that way. Okay. Truth is that way. So it says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Okay? No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. There is no exception based on this verse. Okay? Think about it. If we can pay for our sins ourselves, then Jesus did not have to die on the cross for our sins. The Bible puts it this way. Galatians 2 verse 21. Okay, next. Yeah. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Thank you. So it says here, I do not set aside the grace of God, if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Christ, grace means something you receive but do not deserve, right? It's unmerited favor. You do not earn it. Okay? That's what grace is. So, that's total opposites. It's either grace or law, doing good. Because if you have to do good to go to heaven, there, then it's not grace. Grace is given. All you have to do is receive the grace. So, if, if you're saying it has to be works, then it is no longer grace. It is separate. You have to choose. Do you go to heaven out of grace? It's because of God? Or is it because of works? I have to earn my way you know, and reach perfection in God's eyes, okay? It is only through gaze, it cannot be worse, okay? If there is, is there any other means? First Timothy chapter two, verse five, okay? Um, Charm? For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man is Christ Jesus. Okay, there is one God, one mediator between God and men, and that is? Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the only solution for our sins. He's the only way to be saved. Okay. So that's first Timothy. Yep. So letter B. He provided because we can't do anything to earn salvation. Okay? Because we have this mindset we need to do this and hopefully it all adds up. Okay? Have you heard, have you seen the the old style weighing scales? Okay, the old style way scales. Do you know this? I hate it when I do, you know? Okay? So, you know that? Okay. You understand the way scales? Okay? So, this is good. This is bad. Okay? So, what can happen is, you try to do a lot of good, Okay, do good work, okay? Give one million dollars to the pastor. Okay, and if you do more good, hopefully the scale would tip over 
and oh, I'm gonna go to heaven. Okay? That's what it is. But that's earning it. You're trying to earn heaven. It's not grace. Because grace is unmerited favor. Okay? So, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through Christ, and this is not from ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Okay. So it says, For it is by grace you have been saved. Saved meaning saved from eternal death. He saved you, okay, through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. What does it say? Not by works, so that no one can boast. You cannot go to God and say, you know, when you see God face to face, and He asks you, so why should I let you go to heaven? You cannot boast, hey, Lord, I've been good all my life, okay? When, when uh, Ben Joe was sick, okay, we visited him. We gave him uh, oatmeal, <laughs> whatever, okay? So, so you cannot boast to God that, hey, Lord, because of all this good that I do, I deserve to go to heaven. The truth is, all have sinned, no one deserves to go to heaven. That is why God provided. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. What does it say? It is a, it is the gift of God. Okay? Do you receive gifts? Okay? Whose birthday is it in the month of June? Raise your hand. Month of June. Okay? Okay? So today is Benjo's birthday. Today. And Ia's birthday. Okay? So it's her birthday today. Correct? Anyone else with June birthday? Oh, today, any? Oh, yeah, Sanji. Okay, so it was also my birthday. Today, I'm just saying, it is a gift. Okay, when someone gives you something and you pay for it, is it still a gift? No, no right? It's weird, right? It's not a gift. Okay? Now, in the next payday in your work, okay? Are you working? Who's working here? Can I just check? Are you working? Do you understand this? Okay, the next payday in your work. So you receive, you check your bank transactions, and your money comes in, and you get a pay slip. Do you go to your boss and say, Boss, thank you. Thank you so much for the wage that's now in my bank account. Thank you. Okay, do you do that to your boss? Yes. No, right? Because your, your salary is not a gift. You worked for it. You earned it. Okay? That is why you don't go to your boss. Boss, can I hug you? Thank you so much. You. Okay. you don't do that to your boss because you work for your salary. God is saying you do not work for your salvation because it costs too much for you to go to heaven. Now, no matter how much you work, you will not be able to pay the price tag of going to heaven on your own. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Another verse, in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Verse 5 first, this bigger verse. Um, Nick? He saved us out of God's righteous things we had done because of His mercy. Okay, that first. Thank you. It says, He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. Okay? So again, it's like filthy rags. Okay? You don't earn it. Okay? You, you don't get saved because of righteous things. God makes that as a byproduct of your relationship with God. Okay? But because of His mercy. And I'll just read the rest. It says, He saved us through the washing and rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having justified by His grace, not works, by justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Okay? So it is really by grace. Now, now that you know God has a plan, you also know that man has a problem. And the problem is you cannot do enough to merit heaven. Then, so God provided. There was God's provision. But in the end, there is still man's 
proper response. Okay? You need to respond to this proposal. Okay? Just like any kind of relationship, you must receive the proposal be offered to you. It is given to you, but you have to accept that proposal. In the same way, God is proposing to have a relationship with you, to save you from eternal separation from Him. It is up to you to make that proper response. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, Jared, thank you. Uh, Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, so again, the word gift comes in, for the wages of sin is death. You deserve death, I deserve death, we deserve death. But the gift of God, again, it's a gift, it's something offered. The gift of God is eternal life. And where do you find eternal life? In Christ Jesus our Lord. The proper response is to say yes and receive this gift and to say yes to this proposal of Jesus Christ to be um, to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay? So we can receive this free gift of a meaningful life and a sure place in heaven if we respond properly. I just want to say repentance is turning away from God from sin. Faith is turning towards Christ. So it has to include two things. Repentance. Okay? Repentance is turning away. The Greek word for repentance is metanoia. Okay? Metanoia. So sometimes we don't know what does, met, what does repentance mean. Metanoia, the Greek word simply means, okay, you have a change of mindset. You change your mindset because you realize something was wrong and you change your mindset about it. This is different from the word remorse. The word remorse is you just feel bad about what you did. But when you repent, it means I don't only feel bad for what I did, I also have a change of mindset that I will not do this again because I know it is wrong. That is what true repentance is. Okay? And then it should include this. Faith is turning towards God. You not only, um, repentance is, you not only turn away from sin, but you need faith to move towards something else. And it is through Christ. Okay? It means to trust Jesus Christ alone to save you from the sin problem and grant you a meaningful life here on earth. Okay? Hey, clear so far? Okay. So, okay. so uh, have you seen my drawing already? Okay. So let me summarize. Are you still with me? Yes. Thank you, front row. Back row, are you still with me? Yes. Okay. So the four points is, one is God's plan. Okay, four pieces. Next is man's problem. Number three, God's provision. Number four, man's proper response. Okay. So just to summarize this, you know, I gave gospel cards to the people last Sunday and tried to run out. Okay. So we'll make we'll make new ones. Okay. So this this includes these four pieces and other also the Bible verses. Okay. And during the leaders, leaders, uh, the group leaders assembly, we just taught them how to summarize this and also to draw a little illustration of how it goes about. Okay? So, okay. So, God's plan, right? God's plan is that we have an eternal relationship with Him and a sure place in heaven. Okay? So, this is us. Okay. You know, I haven't graduated stick figures, okay? God's plan is that we have a wonderful relationship with Him, right? 
God wants us to have an eternal relationship with Him. That is His plan. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, The thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it to the full. Unfortunately, man has a problem. Okay? Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have, uh, no, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The first part of Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. So God wants a relationship with us, but because of sin, there is now a gap between man and God. And no matter what we do, okay, we will fall short. No matter how many good works, it's not enough. Let me give you another illustration, okay? Who does not live in the North Shore? Raise your hand. Who does not live in the North Shore? Okay? So about 30% of you do not live in the North Shore. Okay? The gap is too wide that it will, you cannot do it on your own strength. So for example, okay, okay, who is the most athletic person in this room? Who do you think is the most athletic person? Ryan. Okay, Ryan. Ryan. Oh, Ryan also. Okay? Okay. So even for me, okay, I'm not athletic. But what if I said that from the North Shore, I will jump as far as I could to reach the city? Okay? I will, you know? Okay, okay anyway. So, no matter, okay, so even if I jump, okay, jump as far as I can, will I reach the city? Now, just imagine, for example, Ryan also. Okay, I'll just ask Ryan to stand up. Let's welcome Ryan, okay? No, 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 no. Okay, that's just a little injury right now. Okay. He might be more athletic than me. So for example, maybe I can jump 20 meters. Okay. Okay. Maybe I can jump like 2 meters. Okay. But I get someone who is more athletic than me, maybe Ryan, when he's not injured, maybe he can jump twice further from me, right? Because he was he's, he's more capable. But will he reach the city? Right? No. So the gap is too wide between the shore and the city that no matter how athletic a person can be, the gap is just too wide. Correct? In the same way, because of our sin, okay, let's thank uh, Ryan, okay? Because of our sin, if the gap is just too wide, but no amount of good works is enough to build a bridge between man and God. Okay? So that is the problem. Okay? For the wages of sin is death, and Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So God provided a way. Okay? In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God demonstrates His own love towards us, okay? that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And in John 14.6, it says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So God provided Jesus Christ in order to bridge the extreme gap between man and God. Because man cannot do it on his own strength. Okay? But man, having this provision of God, man has to have a proper response. Okay? In John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So man's proper response is to believe. So that is the arrow. If you want to believe, okay? you believe and you receive. In John chapter 5, verse 24, it says, Very truly I tell you, whoever, wait, that's John 3.16, oh, it's not there. But John chapter 5, verse 24, it says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over, crossed over from death to life. Okay? So you need to make that decision. Okay? Let's just read again, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9. Okay, um, who's, who's next? Andrew? Yeah. You can sing if you want. <laughs> For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, 
that by works so that no one can boast. Okay? So it is a gift of God so that no one can boast. It's all by God's grace. So again, that is the offer. The offer is, I give you this gift of eternal life. I paid for it. It's up to you to receive it. Okay? It's up to you to receive it. So for example, if I have this cell phone, okay, is that, how much is an iPhone? Example. Okay, about a thousand dollars, right? Okay? And I say, I offer it to example, Jean. Okay? So I offer it to Jean. Okay? So is the cell phone already with Jean? Have I offered the cell phone? Yes. Okay, it's my gift to Jean, right? But is, is the cell phone hers already? No. What does Jean have to do? Yes. She has to accept and receive it. Uh, okay, she has to accept or receive it. Right? Correct? Yes. Okay, it's an offer, but there has to be a proper response. Now, if I, if I ask you, did it, did, did it cost Jean anything? to receive that gift. No. But is the cell phone costly? The cell phone co is costly. But who is it costly to? It costed me. Right? But it did not cost anything for Jean because it is a gift. But it still costs something. It's just that the cost is not in Jean's side. It is on my side. So the gift is costly, but it did not cost Jean anything because it is a gift. Just like in any gift, all you have to do is to receive that gift. Okay? And when that happens, okay, Jesus is saying he will never leave you nor forsake you. Okay? In the same way, when it comes to our relationship with Christ, God is offering this gift of eternal life. Now, if I ask you one last thing when it comes to that cell phone, what if Jean asked me, Pastor Ryan, where did you buy that cell phone? And I say, for example, I bought it in uh, Harvey Norman, okay, uh, Glenfield brand, okay. What if I find out the next day that Jean goes to Harvey Norman Wairo branch, goes to the cashier, brings out $1,000 and pays for the cell phone. What would you think of Jean? <laughs> huh? Rich. Okay, rich. Okay. Would you think that's wrong of Jean? You think, do you think that's wrong? Why? Why is it wrong for Jean to go to Harvey Norman and pay $1,000? Because it's already paid for. Correct? So if it's already paid for, why do you have to pay for it again? Okay? In the same way, Jesus Christ paid already the penalty of our sin. Because you cannot pay for it anyway. There is absolutely no way you can earn enough points or brownie points from God, from God to earn your way to salvation. So God provided the way, the truth, and the life. All you have to do is now receive it. And you don't have to work for it anymore because it's been all paid for. When Jesus Christ said on the cross, it is finished, he means it is finished. You don't need to do anything else except to take the offer of salvation. Okay? You can express your repentance, turning away from sin, and express your faith, turning towards Christ through faith. Okay? As I, I'm going to close and share with you a few other verses, then I'll just tell you what, what I'll, I'll just tell you what to do. So basically, I'll just copy the, the prayer that's on, on, on your notes, okay? It doesn't have to be exactly like this, because it says like, something like this. Lord Jesus, I want to stop trusting in myself and in what I can do and start trusting in what you have already done when you died for me on the cross. I know that I am a sinner even from birth and incapable of pleasing you. Today, I repent from my sins and I ask you to forgive me. I want you to be my Savior and Lord and live inside of me. 
I totally commit myself to follow and obey you from this day on and for the rest of my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm going to repeat that prayer. And if that is the prayer of your heart, okay, then I will say it phrase by phrase and you repeat it after me. This is not about how long you've been attending a certain church or a certain denomination. What, is, what we're talking about here is that God has a plan for you and He wants you to be with Him forever in heaven. But man has a problem and that is sin. You cannot earn your way to heaven. That is why God provided something and that is that something is Jesus Christ. And all you have to do is to make that proper response of repentance and faith towards Him. If that is you tonight, then you can pray that prayer. For some of you, again, you would have said, Oh, so that's what the Bible says. Compared to tradition, compared to personal opinion, and compared to personal feelings, you say, Oh, so that's what the Bible says. And for some of you, you're saying, ah, so that is the gospel that I really believe in. Whatever it is, I want you to be assured tonight of what the Bible says. And if you want to be sure that you will have a personal relationship with God, and you do not leave heaven to chance, I give you this opportunity to pray this prayer. Do not feel ashamed if you sense that, wow, I think I prayed that prayer, but I'm not 100% sure, make yourself sure tonight. So, let's bow down our heads, and let's pray. So I will just say that same prayer, phrase by phrase. If that is the desire of your heart, then say that prayer and mean it. Okay? This is between you and God. Don't leave it to chance. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to stop trusting in myself and in what I can do and start trusting in what you have already done when you died on the cross. I know that I am a sinner, even from birth, and incapable of pleasing you. Today, I repent from all my sins, and I ask you to forgive me. I want you to be my Savior and Lord, and live inside of me, beginning today. I totally commit myself to follow and obey you from this day on and for the rest of my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. If you pray that prayer, you are basically telling God, Lord, I've been living my life my way and trusting in myself to go to heaven. What you're telling God in that prayer, I now surrender everything and I put my trust in Jesus Christ. So if you pray that prayer and receive Christ in your life, you also have eternal life. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 to 13, and I will read this, it says, And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life, he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Eternal life does not have to be by chance. The Bible is saying so that you may know, even today, you may know that you, can, that you have eternal life. And that is if you have the Son. It says in this verse, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. 
you receive the Son not by religious affiliation. You do not receive the Son by good works or by earning it. You receive the Son when you pray and surrender your life to Him. So if you have surrendered your life to Christ completely, you have the Son. And if you have the Son, you also have eternal life. So if people ask you, where do you think you're going when you die? You can say, based on this verse, I have the Son of God because I, I accepted Christ into my heart and God has regenerated me. Therefore, I also have the gift of eternal life. Okay? So that is your assurance. If that is your decision today, then that means today is like your spiritual birthday. You will no longer be separated from God forever. You will actually be with God forever from beginning to day. You are now spiritually alive and you will now have eternal life. Amen? Amen. So today is your spiritual birthday. Okay? So can we read this all together as we close? Let's see this. Ready? Go. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who doesn't have the Son of God doesn't have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Alright? So, can I just pray for everyone? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, once again for giving us your word. So that we could not, we don't need to guess or second guess how eternal life can be received because your word is clear. We pray that you increase our faith and increase our knowledge of your word so that the truth will set us free from any kind of tradition, any kind of personal uh, opinion or others' opinion or even simple feelings. But we trust what the Bible says. Thank you, Father God. We pray, I pray for everyone here that they will grow spiritually and they will know God's word deeper and they will know you more intimately. Thank you, Lord. Bless the rest of our night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen and amen.